All right, welcome back to Liquid Lunch. It's me, Hugh Jennis here, and we are so happy right now to have Maddie Kasem joining us again in the studio, <laughs> animal communicator, and we uh, we just heard a fantastic story about a lion, and we've mm -hmm. got you. We got so many stories today. Where do you want to start, Maddie? Well, first of all, I want to start by saying. Thanks, Hugh, for having me back, and it's lovely Aww. to be back at Liquid Lunch. I love being here, and, and I'm excited because I met you at a I met you at a social gathering at yeah. at that channel, and now mm -hmm. I get to actually sit with you on well, the yeah. Couch. You guys were hanging out and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is now we'll talk about some other parties because I love to party with the animals, and this is the place where they show up and hang out, and um, anybody can awaken to this party. And the animals keep saying to me, share, 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 which mm -hmm. is why I'm here, is okay. to share some of their stories. And maybe other people will want to awaken and play okay. in this party. All right. Okay, let's do it. So um, I guess my first story is, since the last time I was here, I've moved up to northern Ontario. And when I first moved there, I'm on Manitoulin Island, a fabulous place. And I felt I had to go to this place called Gordon's Park and see the Perseid meteor shower. Oh, amazing. And it's a dark sky preserve, so there are no lights, and I knew nothing about how to go there. But um, I was told, well, you can't take a white light, but you can take a red light. So I took out my old flashlight, and I bought a red balloon, and I put <laughs> an elastic band around it, and I headed up to see the Perseid meteor shower. And I found that I had no light whatsoever. <laughs> that is not a valid red light. Okay. And so um, the place had no light, no white light. And so there were a few tourists there who knew what to do, and they had properly designated red light lanterns. So in the group I was with, there was, you know, a slight amount of light. But when the Perseid meteor shower event was over, um, you know, the talk was over, the activity was done, we headed down to the cars. And there, it was a night with no moon, and I had no light. So I'm walking on a trail in the middle of the night, after midnight, can't see a thing, hear the voices up ahead of the tourists who brought the proper lighting, and right to my right, I hear the bears. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, it knocked my socks off. So I thought, what do you do? I'm not a camper, I'm not a hiker, what do you do? So I know that when people go hiking, they take whistles and things to let the bears know where their whereabouts. So I clanged on my little portable chair with my binoculars, ding, 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 and tell up. I thought, well, I'm a communicator. I'll, I'll communicate, of course. Mm -hmm. So I said to the bears telepathically, hello, good evening. I know you're right beside me. Please do not step on the path because I will faint. And you sound really big. And they thought this was really funny because I didn't know then till I did the research after, but bears are hilarious. They are? <laughs> oh, they're hilarious. So they were laughing. And the more they laughed, the louder they were, and the more frightened I became. <laughs> so then I kept walking down towards my car. And after a while, I thought I should have passed the bears by now. I'm in a wooded area on a little footpath. And they were still there. So finally I said, bears, I'm walking to my car. And I should have passed you by now, but I hear you're still there. And they're like, oh, silly human, why do you think we're here? So then I realized they were there to escort me. They were there for me. And it took me months to figure out that the bears are not local to Gordon's Park. They are not part of the Echo Park. And they don't normally show up. So... I don't know if they were there for other people as well. I don't like to be egocentrical about it, but they were there for me. Mm. They were there for other reasons. It was three bachelors looking for a girl, <laughs> female bear, not me. But um, they became my mentors when I first moved to the island. So my mentors were three bears. And then months later, when winter was approaching, I decided it was time to get a dog. So I telepathically said hi to my bear friends because I'd been checking in with them regularly, right? Because they yeah. said, we'll be your mentors here on the island. So um, I checked in just for fun and said, by the way, 
I'm getting a dog. And again, I hadn't done my research. I didn't know that bears and dogs don't get along. They Not don't. even a little. Oh, yeah. you guys knew that. I, I had I, no idea. I didn't really know that. I just live in this sort of world where all animals love each other and they have to be predators sometimes. But I didn't know that about bears and dogs. So I found out right away because the lead bear said, (laughs) what do you want to go and do that for? And so I explained, well, I'm living here alone. Winter's really long. And then because they're hilarious, I sent them a little film this time, a little movie, a little telepathic video. And I said, well... You guys can't, you know, come and live in the house with me. And I'm here all alone, and it's a long winter. I can't see you bears living here. So they thought that was hilarious, and that was a good remark to make. So they're like, oh, I sent them a picture of the three bears. Because they like to go into houses and buildings sometimes, (laughs) right? They do, Right? But not not necessarily when you're living there. No, not by invitation. (laughs) (laughs) So they thought that was really rich. And, uh... So then the lead bear actually said, well then, I give you permission to get a dog provided that it is for your learning, by which he meant my spiritual growth. Mm. And I thought immediately, I didn't know I needed permission from a bear. (laughs) So, So my relationship with the bears is really rich and really deep, and I learn something new every time I say hello. Mm. Any chance that they were just up there to watch the meteor shower? Oh, I mean, that's yeah. all, it could be a nice place to watch meteor shower for the for them Very too. Very nice, yeah. You know, okay, Maddie, listen. I know we got a lot of this stuff, but I'm going to ask you something totally different. It's oh, not sure. on your yeah, sheet yeah. here, but because uh, yeah. I've heard that uh, there are Sasquatches in Ontario, and there's something weird about these Sasquatches because they communicate. Beyond them being Sasquatches? But hang on a sec. But they're not quite from this dimension or something like that. I don't know. Do you know anything about these Sasquatches? Only that you're the second person to mention that to me. So maybe it's time for me to say hello to those beings. I haven't tried. You definitely have to report back to us on that because I'm Listen, I could send you a video of uh, some Sasquatches in Ontario. And they apparently give gifts to the people. They give mar- little marbles as gifts, and they draw. They do drawings and stuff, and they give them to the to the people. Okay, send me the video. Okay, I'll see if I can dial them up. All right. Um, the way nature communication works is, um, I show up, and the animals have to meet me halfway. Okay. They they show up if they want to. And so when I'm working with a client, for example, doing a consultation, I let them know this is not a reading. Mm-hmm. I'm, this is actually not psychic work. I'm not reading the energy of an animal. I'm showing up and saying hello where the animal is already telepathic. And generally, so far, everybody's wanted to play and everybody is want, has wanted their voice expressed and everybody has wanted to communicate but if they don't want to they don't have to because it's really just communication where they're already communicating so if the sasquatch is ready to come forward and communicate (laughs) and maybe they'll have some conditions and you know like not coming back on that channel and telling us about it Uh, I don't know. We'll see what the criteria are. That would be really sad for Hugh, though, if that was was the main thing. Don't tell Hugh Riley. (laughs) Don't tell Hugh. We like to keep keep him guessing because it it contributes to his sense of childlike wonder. But you are the second person to ask me about that. And how long? Um, Well, in my adventures as a nature communicator. See, because I... Up until long ago, I didn't think there were Sasquatches in Ontario. I thought they were like a West Coast phenomenon. Yeah, I thought they were on the West Coast. Apparently, but I've had visions like I've been out in the woods, like in a lost, lonely lake with no one around. And then I've had this vision of all these Sasquatches coming up over the hills. But it was just a vision. Yeah, like that, like that video. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Chris is finding um, some awesome footage today. Fabulous. Okay. I, oh, visions so, are valid. Now you got you got a whole bunch of other things here, but yeah, we can go any direction. I want to ask like. you this though. This is a, mm. not on here either, but I've had some conversations with some other people, and one of the things I was out in BC last year, and uh, and uh, I was sitting in the backyard in a nice suburban environment, and uh, I was uh, all of a sudden. 
Um, Cause last time you were here mentioned the butterflies are leaving. And I'm up, so this is kind of related to that. I was surprised at how little bird song there was. I was a little disturbed by it actually. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, came back here to Ontario and uh, have been paying close attention to just kind of the sonic, the animal sonic environment around me, listening for birds, paying attention to the insect life, and, and just wondering if I'm concerned. I don't. I don't want. We don't want to lose that. Right. That's a very important part of the overall ecosystem. It's so complicated. It's such a big question, but I do want to address it because I think we're living in a magical time of, I call it the time of the great shift because it seems to me that planetarily there is a huge change happening now which is historic and um, you know the US election notwithstanding. <laughs> Sorry, I just, Don't get her just, going. I'm sorry, just had to put in a little political joke. Well, I thought I was talking about you nature? going. <laughs> no, you can get me going. I saw going. the interview it's, before. It's, 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 it's more, more unsafe to get Hugh going on that subject, I think. Okay. But, but we, we both feel differently about it, obviously. But, you know, um, the animals <laughs> talk to me about it from their point of view because they only see it from their point of view. Or when I talk to Mother Earth, she'll tell me from her point of view. So... Um, for example, when I spoke to Mother Earth, like there's been Standing Rock, yes, has been a big news story over the recent months and drew a lot of attention to what was going on with water on the planet and First Nations people standing up for the water. And so I spoke to Mother Our Earth and asked her her opinion about that event, about the activity at Standing Rock. And I'm sure if I go in and speak to her again, there'll be a lot more. But off the cuff, what she said to me is that this event is drawing First Nations people back together with one voice and giving them uh, a voice, uh, a enabling them to reclaim their voice. Mm -hmm. And from her point of view, it was more about that than the water, which she always has everywhere, somewhere. So it's interesting to hear the different points of view um, from different species when I speak to them and different nature beings um, because there are a lot of different points of view about all these greater topics. And the butterflies did tell me they are slowly, gently leaving the planet. But um, the animals also have said that this is a time where we step up and support them so in all the crises that are happening um, to nature, as people step up and start to do more work and get more involved to support nature and the animals, then that helps the shift that needs to take place. And then the animals, we have no control over the councils that exist within their nations and the decisions that they make, but it shouldn't stop us from stepping up and trying to help. And um, one thing that Animal Nation has told me is that um, animals see things, like they see time in terms of the moon, and we sort of tell time by the sun. Mm -hmm. And they look at food chains, whereas normally I don't even look at food chains. And so um, the animals have told me that we are at the top of our food chain. Mm -hmm. And that Every species on the planet has a predator. Mm -hmm. Except us, then. Well, the animals say that our predators come from within our own species because every species has to have a predator. It's built into the game plan here. Mm -hmm. okay. And so they've actually talked to me about terrorism, a really difficult topic. Mm -hmm. And what they've said is, what they're suggesting is that as humanity steps up, and starts to have more honoring and respect for the animal beings, which are, let's say, um, one step, you know, the beings that are there supporting us, just outside of our reach supporting us, so then terrorism will fall away mm -hmm. of its own accord. So they just, say. Just by us stepping up and supporting the animals. Yes, as we support them with greater integrity and respect and honoring them, then terrorism, which is predators that we have, 
will fall away of its own accord. So it's all right for us to be at the top of the food chain provided we behave in an ethical manner then? Well, they were talking really about these shifts that are taking place on the planet because I think the question was more about the changes that are happening in the animal communities and animal nations around the world. And so that's something that, that they've said. And, you know, over the next while, we'll see how that works out. But are we losing birds and insect species? And, I mean, how does it sound uh, up on Manitoulin, and, uh, you know, when you're well, sitting in the backyard? Well, there was just the Christmas bird count. Yeah. And Manitoulin um, participates in the Christmas bird count, and the results were just published in the last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, some birds are new to the island that were only seen before in smaller numbers are now moving there, but blue jays, for example, there were far fewer. Hmm. So there are people who monitor that and look at that in terms of what can we do to support that. There are a lot of people who put out feeders to help those birds through the winter. Um, so I've been hearing a lot about the uh, changing climate uh, messing with, uh, with migration patterns, especially that some birds are coming back too early or or uh, or leaving too early and not finding their food sources. Yeah, and plants. Them. Do you remember this past fall we had an, some unusual warm mm -hmm. spells? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some plants that were already getting ready for winter started regrowing. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens now in the spring when it's really time for them to regrow? But these things happen. Well, yeah, but we've had we've had in the salmon, great shift. we've had all sorts of things. I remember too. even when I was a kid, right? Yeah. That there was one year where, and we had one a few years ago where spring came early, plants started to grow, and then a frost came in, yeah. right? Killed all the new buds, and they had to start again. Yeah, yeah. you know, so that's but that's those that's different between every like once in a while. You know, we, we we've been fortunate that that as a as a human population, we haven't lost, you know, five years worth of crops in a row or something like that that's happened in the past and in humanity. And I don't know if that's something that's not going to happen because we've figured things out a little bit better or if we're still in danger of that kind of thing. But it'll be interesting if we ever get ourselves in a position where animals need to help us more than we need to help them. Well, they are all here supporting us. Um, I've read that, you know, one way to look at Earth is that it's a big school. So this is one model. Earth is a big school, and we're all here for learning, but the animals aren't here for learning. They're here to support us and mm. our learning. Mm. So another thing is that as um, people show up who want to activate their animal communication skills and start playing that game with the animals, that um, they can start to become part of our learning in a new way, in a new and really exciting way, instead of just supporting us as you know, domestic livestock, for example, or pets. And so animals are ready to participate with us in whole new wonderful ways, and that's really exciting. About um, species that are leaving the planet, I think they're doing it very gradually and very slowly. Some of them are leaving codes so that they can come back if they want to. Some of them are um, have made a decision with their councils, I believe, to not come back. But they don't leave instantly. They leave slowly, and they're here to support us. So then humans fill in the gap where, the, you know, the role the animals used to play. Now I have a really crazy question for you. Another crazy question. Yeah, I'm, just, okay. just <laughs> I'm liking your brain. crazy questions a lot. <laughs> Which will go great with that video that we're showing right now. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, you hear these stories right about uh about it it rains like frogs you've heard those stories right where there's like a frog downpour or fish or something or fish yeah. or something like that now in fact i have a friend who's actually from manitoulin who told me that he actually experienced this personally somewhere in eastern ontario and and i mean I, I wonder if you know, if we're not, we don't really have the full story about how animals get here. That sometimes they may just spontaneously arrive in a, in a in a in a downpour like that, rather than just be born from other frogs and stuff like that. I don't know. It's interesting you would say that because apparently frogs 
one of their roles. Remember I said animals are here to support us. One of the roles that frogs play apparently is to bring rain. So if there's an area that doesn't have rain and you bring in frogs, if you honor them, respect them, and maybe sing to them, will that bring rain? So it's interesting that you're talking about rain and frogs. I was once in Colorado and they'd had a serious drought for a very long time. And just as the drought lifted, there were frogs. So which came first? How did the frogs survive um, however many Mm -hmm. years it had been of severe drought? Where did they live? What Mm -hmm. did they live in? There'd been no water for a very long time. So which came first, the frogs or the rain? Can I, well, I haven't asked the animals that question, okay. but that's a nice See, question to take to the frog. You know, once I saw a frog, I'm just going to tell I saw a frog this big once. What? That is not even stretched out. Seriously, this is in Ontario, in Welland, my hometown. I went to this place, and I drove in to the little parking lot of like a little conservation area. Oh. And I saw this ceramic frog in the parking lot that was like <laughs> two and a half feet high off the ground, right? And I go, look, somebody's put one of these lawn ornaments. But then I went over to it, and it started to hop. That's amazing. And isn't that, I mean, I'm not even joking. This is a truce. I almost put it in the, uh, I said, this has got to be a world record frog. Who has ever seen a frog this big? And I almost put it in the trunk and took it down to the newspaper, but (laughs) but I was afraid of it. It was so big. (laughs) So I didn't do it. So it has to remain a story. So that's great. So, you know, without having spoken to that frog, um, you know, just off the cuff, I would suggest a number of possibilities, like that frog appeared for you for a reason, Mm -hmm. and there was a moment of sacred magic in your life at that moment for a reason. Mm. Mm. And if it's larger than usual, you'll pay attention, because maybe if little frogs had shown up, you wouldn't have noticed. Mm -hmm. So I think animals... And I love working with animals that, you know, historically were called the totem animals or dodam animals, like of the wild that just show up for us, like your frog or like my bears that just show up to be there for us for some reason for a little bit of our journey through life. I have to ask you, um, because you've been talking about um, about awakening to the animal communication, Mm -hmm. I have to ask you, can I do this? How do I do this? How do I follow through with this? Well, because I already talk to animals, um, and I'm I'm the person who walks down the street and chats with the squirrels, and and they seem to to get what I'm going on about. So. Totally, they're very smart. <laughs> so then, that, I notice that a lot. That that um, people will say to me, "I'm already having the conversation in one direction. I'm just not hearing the reply." So how to hear the reply? So one of the things I like to do is teach people how to do it. And okay. Um, I actually have a series of workshops coming up in Toronto um, on Baldwin Street at Wonderworks on Baldwin Street. We know that place. It's very cool. Yeah. Really cool spot. And so um, the reason I do in-person workshops is to reach people who want to activate that for themselves. And it's like a channel. Once you know where that is, you can find it again and again and again. But it's sort of like finding... um, it's you like know, trying to see those three-dimensional paintings and you're looking at the three-dimensional mm-hmm. thing, but it looks flat and then all of a sudden it pops up 3D in your face, right? Okay, that might be how it works for you. <laughs> see, everybody's wired differently. It's different for everybody. And the one thing, I have no idea how it works, but the animals know what our strengths are. So if somebody is very linear in their thinking, um, the animals will send them like paragraphs, sentences of information. So when I was in training... Um, in group classes, some people were just getting paragraphs of information as if it was being typed to them, keyboarded in. And me, I'd get little movies. I'm like, oh, there's this fabulous movie, um, and let me unpack it and see what the message is and what the animals want to say through this video they're sending to me because I'm very visual. So I often get little movie clips sent to me. That's great. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a, a series... Um, January 28th, which is a Saturday, um, I'm going to show people, train people to activate that conversations with the animals. And uh, January, no, February 4th, the next Saturday, we're going to do crystals, Mother Earth, fairies, things related to the Earth. And the third Saturday, 
will just take off and connect with the angelic realm. I, I wanted to ask you about the angelic realm because, oh, yeah? okay, well, because that's one of your things here. Yeah. About the uh, baby bunnies and the injured robin. Oh. And the angelic oh. realms. Can you? Okay. Well, I now um, I studied for four years with Angela McGurr, who's a British angelologist and researcher. And every day I started my day with an angelic meditation, and it activated a lot of cool stuff. So. I've had healing on other planes with the angels. Um, I've been shown a lot by the angels. And the end result is that I now include angels when I do any healing work. So if I do energy healing for an animal or a human, I invite in the angels and I work with the angels. And it really shifts everything. I will never go back to doing it any other way. So... Um, there was a robin, for example, that hit my um, porch window and landed on my porch, and it didn't move, and there was blood on the window, a blood stain, and I thought, it might not make it. This sounded bad. And I didn't want to go out on the porch because I didn't want to disturb the bird. Um, he or she was taking inventory. So I thought, what can I do? I can call in the angels because that's, you know, related to healing. So... I just called out for the first available and I asked the angel of Robins to please come and help this bird with whatever it needs. If it's going to transition, help it with the transition phase and if it's going to get well, help it with that, whatever's coming, whatever it needs. And then I went and got my camera and came back and it was still in the same spot. Not a good sign, right? And I took a photo through the window without disturbing the bird. And, you know, I just have a very basic digital camera. I'm not a photographer. I just own a, you know, a basic digital. And there was the imprint of the angel I had called in. So it's a bit faded now, but I brought it to show you. Yeah, I can so, hold it up to the yeah. camera. So across the bird is the angel in sort of the same shade. Um, that came through because oh. I called one. So you can see the angel here. And the angel was Robin Hood. I don't know if we're going to see this. Mm -hmm. on. Yeah, so that bluish image across the actual bird, the three dimensional bird, yeah. is a uh, profile of a bird. If you follow the lines, it is the shape of a robin in profile angelically so that's not a robin is it no this it bird? is it faded well i printed it out it looks with blue <laughs> i know i know it's faded the you know it was just printed on regular uh, <laughs> paper with i don't have a state-of-the-art <laughs> printer but the point was the yeah. image of the angel coming through in the camera yeah Right, that the camera was able to capture that, and my printout isn't terrific. So but that's it's the good Robin. Enough. So he recovered. I don't know what happened after that. Oh. I left him, oh. and um, maybe he recovered. I'd like to think he recovered. But the you know, the interesting thing is that um, angels are always there if we call on them, and actually they really want to start playing the game in other ways. You know, they're ready to play beyond just being called in as emergency services. Right. <laughs> so you know, what other ways do they want to play then? Well, um, my guidance is I'm going to be creating a healing circle, actually, for 2017. Yeah. For people that want to play and experiment and expand healing beyond the more traditional, even the traditional energy healing constructs, and we'll be inviting in the angels and we'll be playing. Um, if the angels have a direction to take it, we're going to go in that direction, and uh, we're going to make, we're going to sing, and we're going to drum, and we're going to do some cool stuff. I'm just thinking Energy. that there's a a lot of solace in what you're saying for people who love animals, but who suffer when animals suffer so extremely. That I, I've got um, I've got friends who who care about animals so deeply that when they're, the animal's in pain or in suffering, they're or even just the concept of animals being in, in pain, it hurts them so deeply. But the way that you talk about it, it there's, a, there's a 
bigger picture. There's they're transitioning as I guess that's like passing on into a, a, what we would see as death or whatever. The bit that we we see that as being a, a a terribly negative thing, but the way you're talking about it, I'm thinking it would give solace to people because it would it would be more of a continuity, it would be more of a part of life as opposed to something that that ends life in a way that is unnatural. It's so hard for us to get our heads around that, and the animals help me a lot. There's so much more philosophical and objective about these things that we're very emotional about. Um, Even what you were talking about with the with the concept of, of the of the food chain, that's obviously a natural thing. It's not that it's not that we should be stopping animals from eating other animals if it's what if it's what's called for within the context of the relationships, I guess. Mm -hmm. But Jen, back to what you were saying about um, feeling really badly Mm. about animals. Um, I've got a series of three articles I've written on my website, by the way, has a blog and they're also on Blogger. Um, There isn't time to share all the information that's in the three of them, which is why I'm mentioning that. If somebody's really interested in it, they can read the whole series. It's called The Call. And um, the dogs started telling me about the call and I found it really shocking but my friend Anne um, who reads runes first talked to me about her dog Cody and then I followed the chain of events through the dogs that wanted to talk about it so in the dog world and I think other um, species have this they will look for a way to off themselves when they want to And so Anne's dog, Cody, uh, was attacked viciously, and she intervened in the attack and warded off the other dogs and um, suffered injuries herself as a result, saved her dog, and then found out that her dog had cancer. She didn't know it. And then unpacking that and speaking with Cody, what we learned is that Cody had put out the call to those dogs to settle it quickly. Mm -hmm. He didn't want a long, protracted illness. Mm -hmm. He knew he had cancer before his person knew. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to go like that. He was happy with who showed up to answer his call. Mm -hmm. And then I was working with um, a beagle I'd been called in. My client was the person. But the beagle was getting ready to transition. And I supported the family through what happened. And the beagle said to me, you know, Maddie, the call works both ways. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even ask this beagle about the call. But she was getting ready for her transition experience. And she knew that was something I was researching. And she wanted to tell me more about it. So animals are often much more practical about that whole experience. Although it doesn't... um, I'm not suggesting that it's acceptable to harm animals or hurt them, but that they have their own way of dealing with the life process and the death transition, and they're comfortable with that. We sometimes don't understand it. Um, They have their own points of view, and ours are really different. I think that would be very comforting to a lot of people I know. Mm. You know, that reminds me, when I was a kid, another animal story, I found this turtle pretty big painted turtle probably about as big as they get right but a, a lot smaller than the frog well, i'm still fascinated with the whole grown. frog thing yeah anyway i found <laughs> him behind this farmhouse but he was in the septic outflow right oh. a long way from a river or a, a habitat that mm-hmm. would be suitable for and um, we took him home and tried to and he was like oh. hardly moving nice. you know we took him home and tried to give him a fresh environment and stuff but I think now in retrospect he didn't make it I think he went there to die I think that was you know that he it was he was old and uh, it was just his time to go and he and we kind of interfered with that uh, whole process well yes and no you never know you don't know unless you go in and ask but it's possible that you know it was his time to die, mm-hmm. and he knew it and had chosen that transition. It mm-hmm. was a 
place that was available for him to transition, but maybe by you taking him in, he had more comfort for mm-hmm. the transition than he would have had otherwise. Mm. Maybe so he the, needed to learn something about you. Yeah. Mm. You can't underestimate the value of love. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, um, when people are learning animal communication, mm-hmm. I like to say, you know, it's not psychic development. You can open up as much as you want with the animals. It's completely safe because nature is pure love. Mm. So you're showing that animal respect, honor, and love. Like, mm-hmm. it doesn't get better than that. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, what else? Okay, what about the trees, Maddie? The trees. That was so going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think he was reading my mind now. Well, you know, I, I, I put down the trees because um, I just think we can talk all day about animals, but there's so much more in nature, and almost everybody has trees around them, right? We all live with trees, and yeah. at Christmas time, this is just, you know, the new year has just passed, people are in really close proximity to trees, and noticing trees, because we light them up, so we're more aware of them, and they are such great beings. Now, my own opinion is, having talked to trees, and traveled with trees, and done some tree journeys, is that they are living upside down to us. That's my opinion, personal opinion. What do you mean they're living upside down? Well, um, I think they are like cousins to us. Mm -hmm. And um, in that they are upright the way we are upright. And, you know, they are this way. Like, they're not four-leggeds and they don't fly, Mm -hmm. right? They are beings that are um, stand up. They're erect, like we are. And I think we are looking at their torsos and their toes and that their brains are underground which is why we don't understand them very well that's, that's what I really think. cool okay. <laughs> now can you talk to trees yeah okay because we have a tree right behind you there <laughs> and this tree i'm a little worried about this tree oh it's not and doing I, well i i know and i'd like to oh. if, if, if he needs something i'd like to uh help help them out. Okay, well I I could, you know, try and do an off the cuff right now or we could do a little more after we're off the air okay. maybe because I, I can go into it a little deeper if I, yeah. you know, there'll be a little bit of dead time, okay. you know quiet Here, time while here's I Here's the tree just behind you there, <laughs> we're going to we're gonna maybe deal with this this guy afterwards but he's, oh. he's slowly he's Definitely getting, not as happy as this guy is This, this guy's, guy's just going like happy. crazy yeah. even though he's kind of crazy all over the place but uh, this guy over here, he's uh, uh-oh, now what's happening? Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we can find uh, a, a different place for that tree where... Oh. Okay, Maddie. Yeah, we can talk to the tree about a different place that'll put it in uh, where it needs to be All right. for okay, health and growth. Let's do yeah. that afterwards. That's okay. great. Okay. What else would you like to just So about on? the trees, I can yeah. tell you any number of tree stories. Um, the most recent tree experience I had was with this woman named Lucy, so I call it Lucy's Tree. And it's a tree on the island, on Manitoulin, that has nine trunks. Mm. And actually, Lucy won um, a free nature communication in an auction, in a silent auction, where I um, submitted that as um, for a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'd be doing a pet communication. Like, Maddie, I actually don't have any pets, she said, but there's this tree that I sing to. I'm like, who does that? So that was very cool. I got to spend time with someone who sings to a tree, and it's not even on her property, which (laughs) makes it, you know, more radical, right? She goes out to somebody else's property where there is this tree with nine trunks, and she drums there, and she sings there, and she's been doing it for a number of years. And now she was leaving the island and moving to the West Coast and feeling very sad. So she asked for a communication with the tree. Mm -hmm. And what came through was so profound. I was just sobbing. It was so deep and profound and beautiful. And basically what the tree told her is that because of her honoring and respect for it over the years, because of what the gifts, the tree saw this as gifts that she had given to him, her, And in return, that tree is available for her forever. And so then the tree showed me its relay system through the roots and the waterways. It can, if it wants to, communicate with other trees. 
enough that it can send a message all the way across the country if she wants and send communications to her and she can send them back and that tree will always be available. And there is a relay system that trees can access if they want to. And the other thing about this that was fabulous is the tree wanted uh, Lucy to know um, in no uncertain terms that this would not be available for anyone else, not even for me, but only for Lucy because of what the gifts she has given that tree. Mm. So there is a relay system, and again and again when I show up with trees, I'm showing that underground um, the roots are, I don't know what scientists will find if they do the research in this area. I think it's already begun. Um, there are some you know, scientific papers about what they're finding when they look there, um, if it's electromagnetic currents or what the circuitry is, but there is a circuitry and currents, and those are their brains. Well, i got to say, there's something about a root system that does look like the, the human nervous system or the, oh. even looks like the, um, the cells and the, uh, the neurons in your brain because neurons branch out. Oh, good. Great. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. What, uh, did the trees have anything to say about, uh, you know, I, well, it's Lalo who uh, is not here anymore. She's back out west, but... She's involved in protecting some of the trees uh, from logging and that sort of thing. What do the trees say about the logging? I haven't asked them. Yeah. I think it I, might be a touchy I could. subject. Well, um, the animals say they're, when they haven't been here for a while, and the animals that do reincarnate and come back, there are fewer trees when they come back. They find that surprising. Mm. Um, I haven't asked them about that. It, I'd once spoke with a tree that had been cut down and was still growing mm -hmm. and I asked it how it feels about having been cut down mm -hmm. and it said I don't go there I don't focus on that mm -hmm. and if I do I'll die mm -hmm. so I focus on the sun and the things I still love mm -hmm. that are still available to me mm -hmm. and I keep growing wow <sighs> So it may, you know, it would be a difficult conversation to have, but I'm willing to have it. I like to look at things and know about the planetary shifts and changes and find out what's going on that way. But I did ask um, dogs, for example, about breeding because I have a puppy and he came from a kennel and all the people rescuing dogs, which is very similar, rescuing trees from logging, rescuing dogs. Um, and so the dog rescuers typically do not approve of people who get dogs from kennels, the breeding for profit of dogs. And so that's the politics around that. And I wasn't even aware of it. I just needed a dog that was a good match for me and couldn't find one through the rescue system, so kept on looking. And that took me into an understanding of the politics of what's going on. You know, there's a political underpinning in nature with almost every species that you look at these days. So that was the one for dogs. And um, I asked them, what about breeding and the fact that you're in kennels and you're being bred for profit? And this is now outlawed in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which I'm thrilled about because I don't support it, mm -hmm. even though I ended up, I mean, it was a kind of rescue too because the conditions weren't good where those dogs were. Um, rescue of a different kind um, and when I asked they said very philosophically well Maddie it is because of the construct the introduction of the actual construct in human society of breeding dogs for profit the dogs ended up being taken into homes and becoming parts of families and historically they weren't before that turn of events. So dogs attribute that to them getting into a whole new relationship, a more enlightened relationship with humanity. But maybe that, that, uh, maybe that part of our relationship with dogs has, has passed its usefulness now. And yeah, and we can evolve past that and do better. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maddie. So you've got these uh, workshops coming up. Mm-hmm. 
at the Wonder Works on Baldwin Street, mm -hmm. uh, January 28th, February 4th, and February 11th. Um, but what, is there anything else uh, you want to mention? Here no, I'm just we... so glad that we covered so much because we talked about, you know, specific animals and species, and then we went planetary, yeah. which is really <laughs> cool. So thank you, Hugh, and thanks, Jen, for, like, keeping it very cosmic. Uh -huh. It's fun going macro to micro yeah. and back again. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. And if anybody wants a consultation, I love to show up and talk to new animals. I'm always excited by that and ready to do that anytime for any client. And if anybody would like to learn how to find this in themselves, it's not psychic development. Um, if you have a heart and everybody's got one, you can activate that place within where the animals are ready to talk and have that party. And they can get started January 28th or just go on your website and get in yeah. touch directly, right? Yeah, right, exactly. I've needed more animal parties in my life. <laughs> and, <laughs> Definitely. Well, but also people might out there might have a, a troubled animal. You know, they're having difficulty, yes. and if they bring you on board, they can uh, get to the bottom of the problem. And yes, it, right? and it goes beyond pets. I mean, there are a lot of people in Ontario, for example, that ride horses, and there's a huge equine community, and people that are having trouble with um, horse behaviors. Um, horses are very sensitive animals, and I love meeting new ones. So mm -hmm. love to communicate with some new horses or pets or animals of the wild showing up, especially sometimes they're in conflict. They're not always buddies like your animals that show up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, you. Lots Thanks, Jen. Fun. Okay. What's the website again? Maddie Kaysen. Oh, no, no. www.maddie.ca, okay. M-A-D-I-I dot C-A. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, we're going to take uh, a break, I think, although I haven't seen Eden. I don't know if he's in the house or not, but uh, we might be back on Liquid Lunch here at <laughs> thatchannel.com. <laughs>